it hit me. That's not what I have to be. My skill set is in seeing multiple views of a single topic and solving a problem in a different way. And the second I could realize that, yes, there was a way for me to provide value in physics, even though it wasn't typical, it was almost like a night and day shift for me. Welcome to Physicists in the Wild. My name is Aggie Branchik. In this series, we chat with physicists who pursued careers outside of academia. In today's episode, we chat with Bridget Oakes, who did her PhD in engineering physics and is now the director of propulsion at Firefly Aerospace. We're a new space company based in Austin, Texas, 600 or so employees doing a whole bunch of launch vehicles, propulsion development. What would you say uh, your typical day looks like? It's probably less technical than I care to admit. So maybe half of my day is kind of technical advisement support, providing feedback. There's probably a design review somewhere in there for an hour I'm reviewing, maybe a components design. Maybe there's a manufacturing readiness review. I probably have a data review or something kind of like post-process, whether it's a software review, code review, or we just had a launch recently. And so there's been a lot of data reviews from that. So sitting in that And then the other half of my day is because I'm in a leadership position on professional growth and development for the team. So I have seven managers that support that team and 65 employees. And so every now and then I am doing a skip level with an employee. So not my direct reports, but someone that's on my team and just having a one-on-one with them. I probably have a a one-on-one with one of my managers and then recruiting is a big one. Um, So we had probably about a 30% growth this year because we got another uh, Blue Ghost contract, another launch vehicle contract. So there's probably one or two interviews in there. And then there's probably some scheduling and less glamorous budget types of things or approvals. So how did you find the transition from being an individual contributor and doing the technical stuff to having a leadership position? So I may be unique here. I did my doctorate while I was also in industry and I completed it about two years ago. I've been in leadership for four years now. I don't think I had a large shift when I went to a leadership role when I was initially promoted those first two years. The biggest difference I noted was when the PhD ended. Mm -hmm. I no longer come home and work on code or do something technical, right? I was relying on that. If I wasn't getting that in my leadership role, I was coming home and I was getting it out of my doctorate. And that's part of the reason why I did it. Mm -hmm. So it was a pretty stark change, I'd say, in the last year. That would be the biggest difference for me. I'm an analyst at heart and not being the one that's actually writing the code or writing the analysis report, but rather reviewing and providing feedback was tough because I, I, I enjoy that a lot. Mm-hmm. And your time's your own. Like you could put on headphones and just, you know, there are days I love to just be independent and I'm more introverted, right? So I liked the time, you know, Monday, Tuesday, all day, I could just focus on one thing. Mm-hmm. I'm probably task switching every hour, every day in a leadership role. So that was pretty immediate and I handled that super well. That was probably the most immediate shift. And now it's just less of that pure technical stuff. That's hard to Mm. shift. What are your most and least favorite parts of your job? The rewarding days for me when I come home from work are going to be where I saw the team succeed and being part of whatever that professional development was, giving them those engineering projects and letting go of the leash enough for someone to fail on their own, but give them the tools to, to get back up talking with employees and seeing where they want to go and trying to find those opportunities, give them that experience, but not handing it to them in this cookie cutter approach that says, go and do this thing precisely. Here are the rules, which maybe more physicists want. That's a part that's rewarding for me. And maybe the least favorite part is I think in anything, you're going to find some amount of politics when people need certain tools to do their job better. And we don't have access to those where I can't readily hand that to someone or I'm blocked by something that hurts much worse for me. If I can't help someone else succeed and they're depending on me, that's a harder thing to come home to at the end of the day than when I was doing my doctorate and I couldn't get a section of my code to run. Mm -hmm. Like just two completely different senses of defeat, but the weight that I carry with me on the the second half of that just carries a, a larger toll on me. So that part sucks. As a director, do you find that you have to dress a certain way? Surprisingly at this company, no. And that's probably one of the things that I love. Um, I I started my career at Lockheed Martin. And so Heritage Aerospace Company, a lot of um, government contractors and folks that I had to work with. And it was a professional business attire. So for me, that meant a lot of skirts and A-line skirts that for men, they cinch your legs together, heels, jackets. 
um, and your hair was always done. I actually had pink streaks in my hair at the time and I was told to take those out. Um, and I thought that was typical. And so I kind of got used to it, but never really felt comfortable. Another reason is I always sit cross-legged as you can tell. And so being confined in clothes that are more tight fitting or skirts or things like that, that wasn't allowed for me, but new space industry, the culture in the office is much more flexible. Mm -hmm. And I like that a lot. But I would say Firefly specifically, I'm in leadership now and I don't feel like that bar is higher for being a director versus an individual contributor. And I just, I feel comfortable being my authentic self in the office. So beanie cap, comfortable pants, sitting cross-legged, tank tops all the time. Yeah, that's definitely been a, a huge privilege in my job that I didn't really realize was something I appreciated as much as I do into mm -hmm. working here. Let's step back a little bit. You did a master's at the Permanent Institute for Theoretical Physics. So that's pretty theoretical. And you were already doing aerospace before you did mm -hmm. the master's. What made you want to go into this very theoretical side of things? So right before Perimeter, I was at Lockheed. I knew I didn't really like it too much. It was aerospace. The math was interesting. It was in a field I'd studied for for four years, but it was slow paced. I didn't feel like I could push the boundaries, ask questions, be creative. You just kind of had to follow what they told you. So I started looking for other opportunities. Um, I started a master's program with Stanford because I had a school program. So I was like, maybe I'll find something over there. It didn't quite satiate that need. And then I found two programs uh, that I could do in two weeks. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I knew Lockheed wasn't it. Mm -hmm. And one was astrobiology in Hawaii, and one was theoretical physics in Utrecht in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And they were back to back. So I took like four weeks off, went to Hawaii and flew halfway across the world, went to the Netherlands. And I was hooked as soon as I was, I did that like intro into theoretical physics. And I actually saw a flyer for perimeter. Coincidentally, I decided that's exactly where I wanted to be. And before I was even accepted to perimeter, and you know, that's not an easy school to get into, but I quit my job. I was like, I knew that's what I wanted to do. It didn't matter if I got into that school, that was just going to be my new path. How was your experience doing the theoretical physics masters? Um, tough. Uh, I've probably hit what I'd consider like rock bottom or burnt out twice in my life. One of which was halfway through that program. I kind of joke that it was like the first time they decided to accept an engineer and I just didn't have the background. A lot of people did. So I think I just constantly just in and out felt behind and mm -hmm. being in that state of just feeling like I have to catch up and won't be good enough was stressful. And that was probably a lot of that stress was on myself because the mentors there were phenomenal. And I just remembered, you know what, I'm never going to be the smartest person in the room, which I think a lot of us coming into that school, we were used to that type of environment. And I was never going to catch up. The second we went to like Christmas break and came back, it just, it hit me. That's not what I have to be. My skill set is in seeing multiple views of a single topic. And then saying, okay, well, actually person A and person D are saying the exact same thing, just in a different language. I'm not creating something new and innovative. I'm just picking up on all the other tools from my experience and solving a problem in a different way, even though it was solved that way in you know, medicine or some other unrelated field. And the second I could realize that, yes, there was a way for me to provide value in physics, even though it wasn't typical, mm -hmm. it was almost like a night and day shift for me. So as soon as I figured that out, it got a lot better. When you went into industry after your master's, you already had an engineering undergraduate and you had some experience working in aerospace. Do you think if somebody went through just a pure physics stream and then did a PhD in physics, would they be able to transition into aerospace industry? Yeah, absolutely. And then I think a lot of those people, I guess in my experience, would be more of the like guidance navigation control folks, mm -hmm. purely mathematical, a lot more geared to that type. There's probably the highest percentage. I haven't pulled the data, so don't <laughs> quote me on it, but I would say they're the highest percentage of PhDs in an aerospace um, company. And so, yeah, absolutely. You could definitely do that route. What advice would you give to PhD students who are interested in pursuing that direction? I would still say regardless of your focus being more theoretical than practical or hands-on, make yourself a more attractive candidate by getting some more varied experience in different related disciplines, but still different and try to get that hands-on experience. Do you have a hobby that you like? I've had people that have interviewed that there's one guy that absolutely loved like composite technology, but never built anything. And he was a unicyclist. 
So he made his own carbon fiber. He designed it, built his own carbon fiber unicycle. That's hands-on. Do you do pottery? Do you do, uh, someone else loved ceramics. So built several mugs, cups. It's really strong and compressive force, right? So he drove up his pickup truck on four cups that he built. And if his truck didn't fall, he said, okay, that passes. That type of passion, like your experimental method, right? Like you're a creative engineer, you want to solve problems and you went and you built something and set up a test to go prove it out. Those are the things I want to hear in an interview. You don't have to go the typical route, at least for me. A typical route would be like find a mentor, find experience, do an internship. Those all definitely work as well. Are there any skills that you learned in your PhD that are applicable to your job? How to write in LaTeX. You use that? Um, yeah. I do. Uh-huh. Um, and it's actually a requirement to, to generate analysis reports at work. That was a skill that was underappreciated. And I think if you have it, you can just do things a lot faster. I even write my PowerPoint presentations in it. That's a silly one to mention, but that was the first one on the top of my head. I think you're the first so, person who's ever mentioned that. <laughs> I need to type quickly. And that is, maybe I write too many PowerPoint presentations um, or, or reports. I'm already a quick typer, but if I can type as quickly as I can write equations, um, that's really powerful for me. I don't like to waste a lot of time. And then software and programming in general. Um, I don't think I appreciated it as much. I don't use it a lot in my job. Say it's 10% of my job or 5% of my job, but I'm much more efficient at it than I find the majority of other people. And having that software skill as a backstop or something I can fall onto pretty quickly is incredibly powerful. I think there's just like a lot I learned and why code is set up and structured in a certain way that I learned from doing a lot of numerical methods Mm -hmm. in academia that I undervalued at the time and really appreciate right now. Would you say networking is effective in your industry? Yes. I wish it wasn't. That's not really where I gravitate. I'm more of an introvert. I don't really want to socialize with other people. It's challenging for me to get up in front of a crowd or talk or go to more of the conventional types of networking environments. Um, But it absolutely is powerful and absolutely would recommend it to anybody asking for any advice or mentorship that that's something the sooner you do, the more comfortable you'd get at it and the more powerful it's going to be. Uh, When I was building test stands, I was working with a lot of vendors. I need to buy this flow meter. And then I started talking to the people at that company. And then they put me in touch with other people. That seems trivial now, but I can call those same people 20 years later and get huge discounts or whatever it is or uh, benefits that I didn't see at the time. And it got me comfortable talking to a lot of people initially on the phone or in areas that I was better with. I'm not talking to a crowd of people in person. Mm -hmm. And then just building on that and conferences or network events, getting yourself out of your comfort zone. Even if you're not talking, go to each of the booths, practice talking to people and making those relationships is going to help a ton. Mm -hmm. And do it when you don't think it necessarily matters, right? Where you don't think there's as much weight or cost and practice early. So by the time it might matter more for your job, it's second nature to you. That's fantastic advice. Is there any other advice you would have for PhD students who are exploring their careers? I think I felt like maybe early on in my career, you know, a physicist goes to Wall Street or like, what does industry look like? I think there was like a, here are the three jobs you can get in industry. So I love what you're doing. There's no rubric that says what that is. And I'd say go into industry with that mindset, like go to job interviews that you think are tangential. You love statistics, Wall Street. Okay. But look into medicine. You may not have a medical background but they may not be looking for that. You can learn that on the job and you may love it or look at construction or the arts or whatever it is. Sit down in the interview. If anything, Mm -hmm. it's Mm -hmm. practice. It's practice for whatever the real job is that you want, right? right? But, you know, at its core, mathematics and physics specifically, I think have such a far reaching application that we don't utilize enough. And I think those are the game changers. You have someone in one industry going and completely upending another industry because they have a completely unique perspective. Try to avoid picturing what you think that dream job is, especially if you're not sure. But so the biggest piece of advice would be maybe pick five companies to go interview at, not just one or two, and try to make a couple of those a different industry. Some people I think are still unsure, you know, five years later, is this really what I want to do? But if you at least dipped your toe in the water and tried the six other things, you at least have a sense of, okay, I'm more confident now. This is the right place. Thank you so much, Bridget. It was really wonderful to talk to you. You too. Thank you so much for having me. A hyena seems chaotic to me and I don't love chaos, but I respect it. They don't seem like they fit in with anything else. They have spots, they have stripes, they have like this weird ratio of head size to body size. (laughs) And the fact that they don't like fit in this cookie cutter mold, I also like. And they travel in a pack. I may be introverted and like my time alone, but I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't have a solid foundation of maybe five people. (laughs) 